Yeah, now so. you're fries when you're having when you're having session, fellas. I was I started out uh, a couple of sessions ago um, talking to Basir and saying, you know, there's a there's a strata there's a strata of folks that are under say the superstars that nobody knows about, but these folks have been operating. I don't say I was the wrong word, but around for years. I mean, really means at least since the '60s. You know, uh, uh, certainly, but well, James. Dr. James Carney right here, you're one of them. Basir, you're another one. I know a bunch of folks on this level, and it's interesting to me. What keeps you all humble? I mean, I know that's a stock question, but what keeps you all humble? What, what keeps you in the, in the fray? I don't want to say the fight, in the fray, especially when there must have been opportunities for you to jettison yourself to superstardom or, or, or take some sort of uh, whatever, you know? Tell me what it is. It can't just be, what well, kind of principle keeps you that way? It's a stock question. I just need. I just need your. Well, well several things for me. Number number one, um, I had some good training, uh, and I had good training at a young age. And the people that inspired me at a young age gave me a sense of dedication and commitment. And some of the people you know, of course, you know Jerry Donaldson. But first and foremost, uh, because I had a mind that was always searching for answers, didn't have answers when I was very very young, and certain people came into my life. And uh, it was also a part of my personality uh, that once these questions were answered, I was able to be committed uh, to a certain level of responsibility to my people. First and foremost, it was love for my people. There were things uh, that I had grown up thinking I understood that I did not understand and knew couldn't possibly be correct, but I didn't have any answers for it. The first one that supplied any of those answers, and this was just by happenstance, was Malcolm. I did not know Malcolm, but I was around Malcolm on several occasions. The first time I saw Malcolm was in front of the Teresa Hotel, and I happened to be uptown at the age, I don't know, I might have been 12, maybe going on 13, uh, coming uptown to visit my grandmother, to visit my godmother who owned the hat shop in the Teresa Hotel, right on the bottom, Cleo Sims, that was my godmother. If you see any of the old pictures of the uh, Teresa Hotel, that hat shop was my godmother. And I was uptown, believe it or not, gotten some money to buy myself, would you believe this, a pair of lizards or alligator shoes. <laughs> Very popular at the time. Yeah, didn't have anything else to go with it, but I had to have them things. So no, when I no, came no, uptown- No, no Bly sweater? Yeah, no, I didn't have the Bly shop sweater yet. Okay. Just wanted to get the shoes, right? When I hit the corner, Malcolm is there on a platform discussing certain things and I could not walk away. What he was saying, the innate truth of what he was saying was answering questions for me at that time, but I didn't know who he was. So when it was over, I asked the guy, a man in the crowd, I said, excuse me, uh, sir, I said, uh, who was that? And he said, that was Mr. X. I didn't know the Malcolm part yet until many years, but that right there gave me the courage, and I've said this on the radio program, and I've said this other places, gave me the courage to go into Michelle's bookstore, which I, it was terrified me, seals, I was absolutely terrified. I went in to Michelle's books. On one occasion, I went in, Malcolm was in there, reading a book, and Michelle said to me, he said, uh, can I help you, son? You know, and gave me a couple books for free. He said, I want you to come back and tell me about this. I told Atala Shabazz this over at, uh, at Clark House, mm. you know, uh, and asked me, he said, come back. I never did come back, but I did read the book. That was the prelude to Pen and Scroll, because we got the same books at, at Pen and Scroll. But before that, I had heard Dr. Clark speak downtown, and what he said, again, was an inspiration, and it led me to something. Now, as you know, during the 1960s, you know, after Pen and Scroll and all that, I got into a lot of trouble running the streets. You know, I was in gangs and all kinds of different things. The thing that saved me from that life was the preparation, the seed that had been planted that gave me enough courage and enough wherewithal and enough understanding to say to myself that number one, I am going to succeed, but to understand that if my ancestors came out of enslavement, with, enslavement without a pot to piss in, there was no possible way that I couldn't exceed. But in a nutshell, what it was, was dedication to my people, a love for my people, and the undying, the undying notion and effort that there was something better for us, that our ancestors, knowing where we came from and what we had done historically, that there was something better for us. That's what's kept me going. And no matter what obstacles, obstacles come in my way, you know, I always refer back to that. You know, I always refer back to that past to allow me to understand. And now, as a historian, knowing much of the history, 
I mean, there's no possible way that I can possibly stop. Now, there are Negroes who try to stop me all the time in this building here, you know, as well as at the university. It's a constant battle. And I, under, I'm under the fear right now that if I was to retire or to leave the university, that would be the end of any notion of Africana studies at Kane University. And we're just barely holding on as it is right now. We are being supported on some level. But other than that, we are just barely hold, holding on because they're trying to merge us into something else called ethnic studies, mm. you know. And so for me, that's what done it. It's just was the planting of the seed at the right time in a fertile mind, you know, with my own, I guess, what you might call my own innate curiosity and determination just to allow me to survive and keep going. I'm not in this for money. I'm not in this for glory. Dr. Clark used to tell me, and he used to say publicly, uh, quite often you have the people who are out front, but you also have the people who are behind the scenes who get the work done. Mm. You know, I see my job as trying to educate our people, accepting the challenges uh, that our people pose us, because quite often many of the challenges come directly from our folks, the miseducation, the misorientation. You have to, they're almost like the front line you know, we got to get through them before you get to another level. You know, so when you see them in the classroom, it's it's a uh, it's a heavy thing. And uh, you know that I am someone, and we've talked about this before. I am someone who uh, takes on the religious concepts. You know, I challenge all of the diff the prevailing thinking on that. Most of the books I have in here, many of the books are about religion, and I take on those concepts. I I, I am absolutely convinced. I mean, I'm not talking about this idea of us being spiritual, but I am absolutely convinced that one of our greatest obstacles is the control of our thinking through Western religions. Mm. I am absolutely convinced of that. Agreed. And somebody's going to have to show me otherwise. No, I see it in you, Africa. I see you know, it in Africa. You're going to have to show me otherwise. And Dr. Clark and I had many conversations about this. And in fact, the last conversation we had, this is what, a week and a half before he passed, and I was on my way to uh, Tuskegee in my car with Mama Sybil, we were discussing politics, and I just simply made the statement, you know, uh, that I'm under the opinion, and I stick with this to this very day, that we as African people don't have any friends, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And we even have anti-African Africans. We don't even have any friends. And the last thing Dr. Clark said was, I'm in agreement with that. Mm. You see that? You know, part of my issue is, you know, I've come to believe that our people cannot depend on individual charismatic leadership. Now, you can be charismatic, but you don't necessarily have to be the leader. You have to be part of an organization where others can go ahead and step up and fill the void if the void ever occurs, for whatever reason it might occur. So, my thing has been, let's build the institution. Let's build the organization. And I guess over the years, I, I've attained some kinds of skills in regards to going ahead and doing that. So, I mean, very often, you know, I'm called upon to try to help build an organization or help try to shore up an institution because that's what I've been trained to do. And, uh, you know, being in the East, you know, and you gotta think about this. You know, G2 or G2A you see, Baba G2A you see on a lot of levels was charismatic. Uh, he was also one of these folks, you know, almost seven feet tall or whatever, mm -hmm. so, you know, you know, when you got folks that tall, you got every people looking at them, you know, automatically because they're so tall. They got to look up at these people, right? But at the same time, in building an organization, I think he was clear also that the success of the East would not be embodied in him. It would be embodied in all of these young people who essentially had come behind him. And you know, I'm, I'm moving in that particular tradition. You know, there are, you know, a few of us, I guess, who are, are still trying to do that in that particular tradition. I think it's easy to get, you know, kind of put off to the side. I mean, there, there's so many things that can happen. Personally, professionally, 
you know, all different kinds of things can happen. And I think that, uh, you know, these particular issues, when I was talking about the sacrifices, you know, these are some of the sacrifices that people undergo. If, if you're going to be, you know, saying certain things on a regular basis, if you're going to be consistent, you know, it's going to be some sacrifice. It's got to be. You know, I've never looked at my FBI files. I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, I sent for my FBI files, and they sent back an employment op application. <laughs> okay? I sent for my, you know, through the Freedom of Information Act or whatever, I did everything I was supposed to do. I sent for my FBI files. I got back an employment application. Okay? That was a long time ago, but, I mean, the fact of the matter is, you know, you figure that out. Mm -hmm. Now, we know, you know, based upon being under surveillance in the ways that we were, I mean, some of those particular files exist now. I don't even want to know, you know, what's necessarily in those files. I can imagine, you know, especially in regards to when you're traveling, you know, not only in the United States, but traveling around the world, you know, with, you know, a particular you know, kind of diplomatic portfolio. You know, where I'm in Guyana, in South America, I meet Fidel Castro, Comandante Castro, in Guyana, where he makes his first visit in the Caribbean outside of Cuba from the time that he is going ahead and taking power in Cuba to Guyana, where he meets with then Prime Minister Ford Burnham, and they go to the Non-Aligned Conference together. You know, I was there. I was invited to the Prime Minister's uh, residence to go ahead and be part of these folks who were meeting. Now, I was part of this large group, you know, this large delegation that went down to Guyana. I was kind of in charge of it. I was still, you know, once again, I was probably like 23, 24 years old when this happened, right? But I get the invitation in my hotel room. You know, you got to be here. Now, our group had to be somewhere else at that particular time. But, you know, it was like, okay, I delegated some responsibility and said, no, I got to go over here. I have to do this. And I did that. But these are the kinds of things that happen. I think I was telling you this story. I meet Robert Williams in China. Robert Williams, Negroes with Guns in China. Robert F. Williams, my man. I'm in China, right? I'm on a tour. With, once again, a bunch of people. This is the, uh, the Black Independent Schools Tour. The Chinese hosts come to me. Dr. Karenga is on that tour with us, right? They come to me and they say, do you know Robert Williams? And I said, Robert Williams, he goes with guns. Yeah, I know about Robert Williams. Uh, have you ever met him? No. Would you like to meet him? And I looked at them, I'm like, would I like to meet him? Yes. Oh, okay, we can make that happen. He's here in Beijing at a hospital. So they go ahead and they take me to meet him. And we have a conversation, dialogue, or whatever. I have a picture of him with Black News, you know, on, on the table. You know, member of the East, of course, organization at the time. You know, and uh, subsequently, he came to Brooklyn. He spoke at the East. He spoke uh, later on for the National Black United Front. You know, these are all things, you know, through me. He stayed at my house uh, in Brooklyn. But this was all through this kind of... You know, diplomatic piece. Now, what I also did is that um, after uh, Brother Rob, as we call him, left the hospital, I made sure that he met with the entire group. Mm -hmm. You know, because it wasn't just me. It's the principal thing to do. Yeah, it's the group. So I had him meet with the entire group. You know, which is the way, you know, people need to do things, you know, it's not that, you know, we can't depend on our so-called leadership, to, you know, to do things like that in 2016. Because, you know, they've all got their hands out, you know, trying to see what they can do. And it, it's, it's, it's really, really amazing. I'm looking at the development to an extent of Black Lives Matter. And I see that some people have that same particular tendency in regards to, like, I want to be in a position using social media where I can be perceived as being the leadership of this, of being everywhere in regards to this. So I want to make sure that I've got a, pho a photographer yeah. photographing me when I get arrested. And I want that to be sure that it's on Twitter and Periscope or whatever it is that I'm using so that everybody will know it's me that got arrested. Okay? 
Imagine Dr. King getting arrested and being like that. You know, you can't, you can't even imagine that. Because that's not who he was, even though he is part of that charismatic individual leadership that I talk about. But he was so principled. You know, imagine him being like Jesse Jacks now. Mm. Or Al Sharpton now. You know, folks who have their hands out regularly. You know? Either their hand out or in somebody else's mm. pocket. Uh, I, you know something? Now I don't need to do the whole thing. I need to do me now for this particular one. Just frame me right. Just the raw thing. Interestingly enough, um, I'm of that sort of weird strata also, but mine is a, a little easier. Um, when um, when I was at uh, well, I was at Negro Ensemble Company um, at a very young age, and what happened was uh, the. All the classes had, I was in the intermediate class, and we had to do a, a presentation. And so they did a present, we did a presentation, it's called The Last Dragon. Okay, not, not the film list, but The Last Dragon is a play. That, but the, the woman that, the, the girl, they were girls, at the time that did it, what she did, she made me the title character, The Last Dragon, the struggle about this dragon, and it being, you know, racist, people taking over, whatever the deal was. And, uh, but at the end of that, at the end of that, uh, put, at the end of that play, that, that performance, um, a little girl, she must have been about 13, say little girl, I was about 17, came up to me and wanted my autograph. And it was weird. It was like, I never had anything like that happen to me. I was like, this is strange. I said, no, I don't, why well, do you want my autograph? I'm just being suspicious. But no, I didn't, it just hadn't sunk in that I was sort of like the, the whatever the play. You know, so I gave her an autograph, but it started to stick with me. And this was at Negro Ensemble coming to the early days. It's the very beginning, uh, 1967. Uh, 68, and uh, that that summer, um, I, I did lights for uh, for Daddy Goodness there that uh, uh, the summer of 68, and uh, and doing the lights we had to string the lights whatever have you, and uh, I think uh, I, I think it was Michael Schultz was doing the lights was direct, was designing the lights and but the guy Buddy Butler was was there, and they both came to me, and they said, well Anthony, no you're 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 all right actor like that, but we need people to turn to use behind the camera. And it's weird because I have this mind that if you say something that makes sense to me, you can say it one time. And I'll just say, oh, sure, that makes sense. So they gave me to at Cambridge and he trained me as a stage manager. And I ended up basically all the way behind, it, behind the scenes, string lights, all, all, all the rest of this stuff. But being as a stage manager, I learned to do just that, to be the glue. To be the sweet, to sweeten everything up, the, to not be out front, to make to be a part of an organization. And to this day, I'm, I'm more into in, in building organizations and, and stuff like that. And I'm attracted to people who do the same thing. It's almost like um, uh, when they say a uh, 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 game rec recognizes game. Well, like uh, let's say uh, you you will recognize somebody that has principles like you. So I'm always. It's interesting. I, I'm only attracted. I'm always people in my circle are only principal people. I find and it's easy for me to find a, a principal person, especially this late in life. It's easier, you know, than, to, than somebody, some slinky person come up to me, I can see it right away. You know, ah, pfft, just knock them away like that. So, um, so that's my, that's my story. My story really is, I think that what holds uh, the level of folks like you or us together is that at a certain point, we recognize a, a, a lizard when they're coming. We rec we recognize a, a, a king or queen when they are coming, and and we we're, we're, we're attracted to that. And you can't pull the wool over our eyes any longer. Thank you, fellas, for um, partaking. I'm through. I don't. We don't have to do anything else. It's been a wonderful session. Um, Dr. James Kanye, who I know is buddy, my fraternity brother. Oh, I'm telling you, Basir. I wanted so long, I mean, that's so long, I mean, I was so devastated last year when I figured, I didn't talk to Basia, I just needed to get your story, this is not even the, the, the tip of it, I know you got a lot more to say, and some particular point, have people, talk to people, get your story down, talk to a machine, make them make little cartoons about your, your, your life, because it is an amazing life, I really respect what you do, and it's, it's just, I mean, and you, 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 like the rest of us, keep the good fight going, thank you so very much. Next time you come, 